بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد In our last week's uh, halaqa we had begun to discuss uh, the famous incident of the immigration of the Muslims to Abyssinia and we had mentioned that in the fifth year of the da'wah in the month of Rajab the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had allowed the Muslims to immigrate to Abyssinia and we had mentioned that the reason why Abyssinia was chosen is because they had the freedom to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we derived a number of benefits and, and uh, uh, important morals that we can derive and especially for us here in America there's a lot of wisdom and benefit uh, with that parallel of living as a minority in a non-Muslim land. Now, shortly after the immigration to Abyssinia the Muslims returned back to Mecca. In fact, so much so that it is narrated that they came back within three months, the month of Shawwal. So they immigrated in the month of Rajab. It takes around four or five days to get there. And so Sha'ban, uh, uh, Rajab, Sha'ban, Ramadan, and then Shawwal. And in the month of Shawwal, they all returned. Now, why would they return just after three months? What happened that caused them to change their minds after emigrating to Abyssinia and then come back to the very land of persecution, the very land of torture? This incident is the famous incident that some have called, have called the Satanic Verses. And so we need to discuss what exactly was this incident and why did these Sahaba, why did these uh, 14 or 15 people, 11 men and four women, so around 15 people, why did they return back? They returned back because of one rumor. And that rumor was the Quraysh have accepted Islam. Now, you can imagine life in this strange land. Any of Anybody who's moved, even when we move in the modern world, the most difficult time of moving, the most difficult time is the first week of actually getting there. When you don't have a house or you don't have a, you're not settled down, you don't have friends, the most difficult time of any movement is basically as soon as you get there. Even in the journey, okay, you're waiting to get to the destination. Once you get there and then you realize it's such a different place from what you're used to. So it was an extremely difficult time even though they weren't persecuted. But just acclimatization, different language, different culture. You can imagine a whole different set of norms. They're not used to it. And so, some rumors spread that they just pounced on. Some rumors spread that they just embraced instantaneously. And that rumor was the Quraysh have accepted Islam. No matter how wild the rumor sounded, their hearts were yearning to go back. And they didn't have the connections that we do with the modern facilities to verify. There's no way they're going to send a party there. There's only 15 of them. And the rumor spreads the Quraysh have accepted Islam. So they decide, well, if they've accepted Islam, khalas, we don't need to live here. So they pack their bags and they come back all the way back. And on the way there, they discover that this is in fact not true. It was a lie. Or it was an exaggerated rumor. To be more precise, it's not a lie, but it is an exaggerated rumor. What is the basis of this rumor? How did it come about? Here we need to now talk about what we, what some people have called the satanic verses. Now, before we begin, we need to understand that the whole controversy comes over whether this incident is authentic or not. The whole controversy comes over how do we understand this incident. So let us talk about the different versions of the story that exist. And uh, to be simple, even though this is pretty academic, inshallah, but still to be simple, I'll talk about uh, three versions. Even though there are more than these, but we'll talk about three versions. Version number one. Version one is the version that is reported in Sahih al-Bukhari. And is the version that is obviously the most authentic. And it says in this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that... In the month of Ramadan, well, the date is not given, but we, we learn from Ibn Ishaq. The month is not mentioned in, in, uh, in, Buk in Bukhari. But in the month of Ramadan, in the fifth year of the Hijrah, two months after the Muslims have immigrated, the Prophet ﷺ recited Surat An Najm, Wan Najmi Ida Hawa. The Prophet ﷺ recited Surat An Najm in its entirety from beginning to end. And Surat An Najm 
is a very powerful surah, very eloquent surah. And when he came to the very end of the surah, when he finished the surah, the very last uh, verse in the surah basically says, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا That prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship Him. And so the momentum built up in the surah, and the excitement built up, and the power of the Qur'an affected the entire congregation, Muslim and non-Muslim, such that when the Prophet ﷺ said, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا The Muslims fell into sajda. And when the Muslims fell into sajda, the Quraysh were so overwhelmed with emotion, they too fell into sajda. And Muslim and non-Muslim, for the first time, united together in worshipping Allah. Now they're worshipping Allah, there's no idol here. Right? فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا Muslim and non-Muslim, for the first time, they all united behind the Prophet Muhammad Right? Except for one person, the riwayah says, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he was too arrogant, and he was an old man, so he picked up some sand, and he put it on his forehead, and he said, this is good enough for me. You guys prostrate, I just put the sand to my head. Right? This is good enough for me. Except for him, now that's a side point, not related to the story, but the point being that everybody prostrated behind the Prophet ﷺ. Now by the time the rumor made its way from Mecca to, to Abyssinia, right? The rumor begins a hand span and it returns back an arm's length, right? By the time it reached Abyssinia, the rumor had become what? They've all accepted Islam, they've united behind the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Simple story, right? Simple story. And this is the story of Al-Bukhari. And I want to really, I, I wish we had the time to, uh, to really go over all of Surah Al-Najm. But the fact of the matter is that Surah Al-Najm is such a powerful surah. And it is such an eloquent surah. And the last verses, especially, they build up a pitch. They truly build up a pitch and they, there's an element of excitement that's being built up and verse by verse and there's so many questions being asked towards the end that even the Quraysh, according to the version of Al-Bukhari, even the Quraysh were overwhelmed by the sheer power of the surah. And just to finish up the surah, uh, I want to just recite some of the verses at the very uh, end uh, to give you an idea of what this surah is talking about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أم لم ينبأ بما في صحف موسى وإبراهيم الذي وفى ألا تزر وازرة وزر أخرى وأن ليس للإنسان إلا ما سعى وأن سعيه سوف يرى ثم يجزاه الجزاء الأوفى وأن إلى ربك المنتهى وأنه هو أضحك وأبكى وأنه هو أمات وأحيا وأنه خلق الزوجين الذكر والأنثى من نطفة إذا تمنى وأن عليه النشأة الأخرى وأنه هو أغنى وأقنى وأنه هو رب الشعرى وأنه أهلك عادن الأولى وثمود فما أبقى وقوم نوح من قبل إنهم 
كانوهم أظلم وأطغى والمؤتفكة أهوى فغشاها ما غشا فبأي آلاء ربك تتمارى هذا نذير من النذر الأولى أزفة الآزفة ليس لها من دون الله كاشفة أفمن هذا الحديث تعجبون وتضحكون ولا تبكون وأنتم سامدون فاسجدوا لله وعبدوا this translation, the very last, now the Prophet obviously is reciting it from the very beginning and it builds up even more so. This translation, the very last 10 ayat, Allah says, Is not the listener aware of what is in the book of Musa and in the book of Ibrahim who fulfilled his engagements? Namely, that no bearer of burdens can bear the burden of another and that every man will be rewarded or punished for what he has done. For the fruit of his own striving will soon be in front of everyone to see. Then will he be rewarded with the complete reward. And indeed to Allah is the ultimate goal. For it is Allah who makes people laugh. And it is Allah who makes people cry. And it is Allah who makes people die. And it is Allah who gives them life. And indeed it is Allah who created everything in pairs. Male and female from a seed that is lodged in its place. And it is Allah who has promised a second creation. This is the first creation. Allah has promised the second creation. And it is Allah who gives wealth and satisfaction. And it is Allah who is the Lord of the mighty Sirius, the star in the sky, the mighty Sirius. And it is Allah who destroyed the ancient people of Ad and the people of Thamud. They too are not around. And before them even the people of Nuh, for indeed they were the most unjust and the most insolent of transgressors. And it is Allah who destroyed the overthrown cities, here the scholars say of Sodom and Gomorrah, so that the ruins have covered them up. Then which of the signs of your Lord will you argue about? This is a warner, the Prophet Muhammad Just like the warners of old, Allah has destroyed Ad and Thamud and Nuh. You are not any different. Allah has destroyed the people of all of these prophets. This prophet is the same vein as them. And the judgment is ever approaching, coming closer. None but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reveal its time. Do you marvel at this recitation? And you are laughing and making fun of it and not crying. And you're going around your daily activities ignoring what is going to happen the day of judgment. Rather, ignore all of this. Fall down in prostration to Allah and worship Him. Now the reason I recited these 10 verses and one did the translation is to show you that imagine the Prophet and reciting the entire surah, at least 15-20 minutes of beautiful recitation. And it's a powerful recitation. It really is an emotional surah that makes people follow along verse by verse. These are short verses. They're rhetorical questions. And the people's emotions are getting higher and higher. And then when the Prophet falls down in sajda, the Muslims fall down, even the Quraysh fall down. And so version 1, which is the Bukhari version, is the authentic version. No question about it, and it doesn't need any far-fetched tale to explain it. Now we get to version 2 and version 3, which is where it gets a little bit mucky, a little bit dirty. Version Now, the version of, of Bukhari, by the way, is narrated by Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas said the hadith is in Bukhari, Surah Al-Najm, Tafsir Surah Al-Najm, the chapter of Surah Al-Najm. Uh, Ibn Abbas said that the Prophet recited Surah Al-Najm. And he prostrated. And all of the Muslims and the Mushriks and even the jinn and the ins prostrated with him. Everybody who heard the surah couldn't help be overwhelmed, even the jinn prostrated with him. And he said, except for one man, and this is Al-Walid ibn Mughira, he took sand and he put it on his hand, head, and he said, this is sufficient for me. In another version, it is Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Basically, one of the two really 
strong or staunch enemies, they were arrogant and they didn't prostrate. That's just a detail not really relevant to the surah. Now, this is version one. It is the authentic version. There is no mention of shaitan. There's no need to mention shaitan. We now get to the disputed versions. Version two and version three. Version two and version three revolve around riwayat or reports that are not found in the famous books of hadith they're not found in the six books they're not found in Muslim Imam Ahmad they're not even found in Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham which are the standard sources of tafsir rather they are found in the more obscure works and the larger collections the encyclopedias the tertiary works they're found usually in the books that collect everything such as a Tabari's tafsir. Tabari's tafsir, we need to understand one thing. Tabari did not intend to write a summarized tafsir for the masses. He wanted to write an encyclopedia for the scholars. And he collected everything that he found. And he mentions this in the beginning of his famous book. He says, I'm going to mention everything that I hear. I don't care if it's authentic or not. My job is just to report. So a Tabari's reporting doesn't mean anything. He's just collecting. It's just like... Uh, any unfiltered news source, it just narrates everything, right? A tabari is not Bukhari. Bukhari is a critical collector. Tabari is saying, I'm not a critical collector, I'm just collecting everything. And so these reports are found in Tabari in more obscure book, books that are not standard books, such as Al Wahidis, Asbab al Nuzun, and others. And it mentions a story involving shaitan, involving Iblis. And because it involves Iblis, a Western researcher, uh, one of the first researchers of this century to specialize in, in Islam, they were called Orientalist. His name is Sir William Muir. Sir William Muir, and he died 1905. He was the one who, for the first time, said, This is something we'll call it the Satanic Verses. The name Satanic Verses is not found in the Quran and Sunnah, it's not found even in these weak narrations, it's found or it's coined by a Western researcher, Sir William Muir. Sir William Muir is a Presbyterian minister who specialized in Islam and he became one of the uh, professors of Islam in, in Scotland and he's a very famous Orientalist. This is a hundred years ago, hundred years ago. And he's ri written a very big book about the seerah in English. And it was one of the first books of seerah in the English language from a modern perspective, a hundred years ago. And so he labeled the chapter, the Satanic Verses. So the term satanic verses comes from William Weir. The Islamic sources that do mention it, they call it Qissatul Gharaniq. And Gharaniq is the name of a bird. Uh, I tried to find out the equivalent. P uh, modern Arab uh, linguists have differed. What is the English equivalent of the bird? Is it the, the heron? Is it the pelican? Is it the crane? Some people have said it's a pelican. Some have said it, it is a crane. But it is a bird with a long neck. And some have said it is a heron, H-E-R-O-N. And others have said it is a pelican. But it is a bird with a long neck. So in Islamic sources, this is called the story of this bird. Qissatul Gharaniq. Why? We'll understand now. What is this story? So now let's talk about the two versions of the story. In essence, they're the same, but there's one crucial difference. And we'll explain this difference. So let's get on to uh, version 2 of why the... Abyss why the Abyssinian Muslims, why the uh, Quraysh returned, or why the Muslims emigrated and then returned. Version 2. Remember version 1 is Bukhari, right? That's clear cut. And it's definitely authentic. No question about that. Version 2 and 3 are adding details that are not found in Bukhari. So we need to now discuss them. What is version 2? Version 2 is reported by Al-Tabari in his tafsir. And it goes back to Urwa ibn Zubair, the famous Tabi'i. He's not a Sahabi. And this is the main weakness, that Urwa never saw the Prophet ﷺ, and Urwa is not narrating from the Prophet ﷺ, so there's a missing link, right? And this is one of the biggest weaknesses right now. Urwa ibn Zubayr said that when Surah Al-Najm was being recited, now pay attention to this, in the first page of Surah Al-Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'll give you the ayah number uh, right now, ayah number 19 and 20. Najm 19 and 20. Have you not seen Allah and Al-Uzza and the third of them, Manat? Have you not seen Allah and Al-Uzza and the third of them, Manath? What are these three? These are the three? The three gods, the three idols, right? Now, in the Quran, verse 17, have you not seen, verse 19, have you not seen Allah and Al-Uzza? First, uh, uh, 
uh, verse 20, and Manat, the third of them. Verse 21, are you going to get the females and you will give him the males? Remember the Arabs look down at women, right? So the, uh, the Allah is telling them, so you give him what you discard. You're going to kill girls. And yet you want your Lord to have daughters. Tilka idan qismatun diza. What an unfair uh, sharing. This is what the Quran says in front of us. Now, what is the story? You need to pay attention. A little bit of academic things here. So verse 19, verse 20. Have you seen Alat and Uzza and the third of them Manat? Urwa ibn Zubayr said, after verse number 20, Shaytan cried out. And he added two verses that were not in the Quran. And these verses were heard by the Mushrikun, but not by the Muslimun. Shaytan cried out in his own voice, in his own tongue. And he added two verses. Have you seen Allah and Al-Uzza and the third of them Manat? This is in the Quran. Then he added, Tilka al-gharaniq al-ula wa inna shafa'atahunna laturtaja. Gharaniq, this is where we get this from. These idols are the mighty pelicans or cranes. Gharaniq al-ula. These are the high and mighty pelicans, beautiful pelicans, right? Wa inna shafa'atahunna laturtaja. And their requests will be granted. Now this is the first time that the idols are being praised, apparently. Right? The idols are being praised. That these idols are beautiful birds. And their intercession will be accepted. You should worship them. And so, Urwa says, when the mushrikun heard these verses, they thought, the Prophet Muhammad has compromised. Finally, he's come to a middle ground. He's willing to accept our gods. And did they have a problem accepting Allah? Did they have a problem? No. They had no problem accepting Allah, right? Because they believed in Allah. But their problem was, you rejecting our gods, right? And so, they said, according to this version 2, they said, the Prophet Muhammad has agreed to accept our gods. And so when he finished the surah and the, he prostrated, they basically said, we're all in agreement now. We don't mind worshipping along with you. Do you see version 2 now? Right? This is version 2. Now, why are the gods called gharaniq? Uh, gharaniq because some, again, this is interpretation. Is that just like the beautiful birds with long necks are going up to Allah. So these are idols that are going to take you up to Allah. This is how the, it is interpreted. So this is version number, what version are we talking about now? Three. Version number two. Version number two. Now, version number three. In yet other narrations, and these are found in Al-Wahidi and other sources. So we have to be very clear here, and our religion tells us to be academic. The satanic verses story is not concocted by non-Muslims. It's found in some of our sources. We have to be very clear here. Right? And by the way, a lot of you are confused. Salman Rushdie's book, of course, it's named after this incident, but it's a whole work of fiction. But the, 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 the point of the book is that, and this is why this is such a, a thing that the non-Muslims jump on. Apparently, the Prophet ﷺ could not tell the difference between Jibreel and Shaitan, or at least he's reciting verses. Now, from the perspective of non-Muslims, if this story is true, what would this mean? That the Qur'an is obviously being changed per whim. And one day, he, the Prophet says, no, I'm just saying what they say, so that we understand as Muslims, so don't quote me on this, astaghfirullah, this is kufr to say, right? I'm just saying what they say. So the Prophet a'udhu billah, I'm just saying what they say, tried to change his tactic and said, let's see if this is going to work. And he decided to change from tawheed to shirk. And so he said, khalas, let's worship all the gods together. But then there was a backlash from the Muslims. And so he said, oh no, these weren't verses that I said. These were verses shaitan said. Hence, satanic verses. Right? So from the perspective of non-Muslims, this story clearly proves to them that the Prophet ﷺ is, I would be like, inventing the Qur'an. That's what they say. 
right? And so he's just changing his theology one day to the next. As any leader, as any politician does, he sings the tune of the people, right? One day he'll say this, one day he'll say that. So he's, according to them, changing his tune to get the people to come to him, right? And so this is why this story is a very important story that we talk about it academically. And I have to say clearly, this story is not fabricated by non-Muslims, it's found in our sources. Right? And so they jump on it, and they then make a very big deal out of it. And this is something that we need to discuss academically. So this is version number two. Version number three is even worse than the second one. In version two, shaitan recites out, and the people here, correct? Version three is even worse. In version three, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam hears shaitan's recitation and thinks it is Jibreel reciting to him. And he then, in his own tongue, recites, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةَ وَمَنَاتَ ثَالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى تِلْكَ الْغَرَانِقَ الْعُلَى وَإِنَّ شَفَعَتَهُنَّ لَتُرْتَجَى Do you see the difference between two and three now? Right? And this is of course even worse because we are now saying, or those people who say this are saying that the Prophet couldn't tell the difference between Jibreel and Shaitan. and Shaitan. And this is the premise of Salman Rushdie's book. That he begins the whole story with. That. And it's a fiction, fictional book, but this is the premise. And he called the book Satanic Verses, and then that caused a whole fear. Uh, that's not relevant to our discussion. The book and what happened, that's a different discussion. We're interested in the actual story as found. Now, once again, we have to be academically true here. This is a version that is found in early Islamic Arabic sources. It's not something that I looked up myself, to be on the 100% sure, that this is not something they're inventing. It's something that is found. Some early books do mention it. So, we have now three versions of the story. The first version, Sahih al-Bukhari, and this is the version that is put in the six books, and Muslim Imam Ahmad, in other words, from our perspective, basically the most authentic, the New York Times or whatever, the most authentic sources, they have this version. Then you get lower and lower in your authenticity, and then you have some details that are very strange. In version two, the details say that shaitan screamed out, and the mushrikun heard and the Muslims didn't hear. Right? And so the Muslims didn't understand why the Quraysh prostrated. And they just thought that the power of the surah was that. In the third version, which is the most difficult for us to swallow, in the third version, shaitan pretends to be basically who? Jibreel. And when Jibreel is reciting the Quran, shaitan frozen two verses. And the Prophet ﷺ could not tell the difference. And so the Prophet ﷺ recited those two verses in the middle. And then, when the Quraysh prostrated, according to these reports, Jibreel came back to him and said, what did you recite? And so the Prophet ﷺ recited with those two verses. And Jibreel said, I never recited these two verses to you. I didn't come with these two verses. And the Prophet ﷺ became very depressed and very hurt that he thought that he was inventing this. And then Allah revealed, now this is another version of the surah, another version of the uh, incident. Allah revealed Surah Hajj verse 52. Surah Hajj verse 52. Surah Hajj verse 52, what does it say? It's a very important verse. And according to this interpretation, it is linked to the satanic verses, so, uh, story. Surah Hajj verse 52 says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ إِلَّا إِذَا تَمَنَّا أَلْقَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي أُمْنِيَّتِهِ فَيَنْسَخُ اللَّهُ مَا يُقِ الشَّيْطَانُ ثُمَّ يُحْكِمُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ That never did we send before you a prophet or a messenger except that when he إذا تَمَنَّا when he, now here's what does tamanna mean? Uh, for now, let us just say it means to recite, even though there's another interpretation. One interpretation says, when he recites, Alqa shaytanu fi umniyatihi, shaytan adds something to his recitation. And then, Allah abrogates the shaytanic recitation, and Allah affirms his own ayat. Thumma yuhkim Allahu ayatihi. For indeed, Allah is all knowledgeable and Allah is all wise, so that... The one that shaitan said, or the thing that shaitan said, will become a fitna. 
for those who have a weak heart and for those who have a uh, sorry a disease in their hearts and for those who have a hard heart qasiyati qulubuhum right so shaitanic revelations or shaitanic verses will become a fitna a test for those who have a disease in their hearts now that's in surah al-hajj it's in there so according to this version shaitan actually succeeds in in deceiving the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu recites satanic verses, and Allah then corrects the satanic verses, and the proper recitation is revealed, and therefore the Quraysh who initially said, "Okay, let's all join hands," they say, "No, we're not going to join hands," and so this reaches the Muslims of Abyssinia, and then they return. Now, let us spend a little bit of time, academic study, let's look at these three reports. There is no question that the first report is authentic, it is in Bukhari. The issue comes, of course, those who follow the second or third opinion don't find a contradiction in Bukhari, and this because the gist of the story, Bukhari has an outline. He recited Surah Al-Najm, everybody prostrated. Version 2 and 3 can accept this outline, correct? Right? So Bukhari's version doesn't contradict version 2 and 3. Therefore, this is the problem. We don't need 2 and 3, but Bukhari's version doesn't contradict. So those who accept 2 and those who accept 3, they accept Bukhari as well. And they say, Khalas, Bukhari is also authentic. Now, what do we do with all of these? The first thing we do as lay people. As lay people, let us see what the scholars say. Sadly, the scholars did not all agree. Usually scholars agree about many things, but sometimes they don't all agree, and that's why it becomes a little bit more difficult, right? So we have, for example, a good group of scholars who rejected version 2 and 3, and they stuck with version 1. Alhamdulillah. And these were big names. People like Ibn Kathir, the most famous scholar of tafsir, right? People like Al-Qadi Iyad, who is a specialist in seerah. People like Fakhridin al-Razi, people in our times like Sheikh al-Albani, who's one of the greatest scholars of hadith of our times. He passed away five, six, eight, nine years ago, ten years ago, actually, subhanAllah, the time flies. Uh, Sheikh al-Albani passed away, uh, but he was the greatest scholar of hadith alive in our times. He wrote an entire booklet about this story, just this story he wrote a booklet on it. And he went over every single report, wherever it's found. And he shows in academic detail that everyone is weak. Everyone is weak. And so we have a lot of very famous people saying versions 2 and 3, we cross them out. Version 1 is enough. Uh, one of the famous scholars of the past, uh, Muhammad ibn Ishaq ibn Khuzayma. Ibn Khuzayma is a great scholar of hadith. He died 311 Hijrah. Uh, and he was one of the few people who wrote a Sahih book. There's four people who wrote Sahih books. A little bit of a tangent here. Bukhari Muslim, Ibn Hibban, Ibn Khuzayma. Four people wrote Sahih books. Ibn Khuzayma is one of them. And so Ibn Khuzayma is one of these great scholars of hadith. He was asked about this story. The story of shaitan inspiring the process of him. He said, this is a fabrication that the enemies of Islam did to try to destroy Islam. This is going back 311 Hijrah. From the very beginning, some people are saying, this is a fabrication that the enemies of Islam have done to try to destroy it. Okay, so this is one group of scholars. How I wish that we could have restricted ourselves to them. Unfortunately, there are scholars who do follow the other versions of the story as well. And they are big names. And because of this, we have to be academically fair. Our religion tells us to not hide the truth. Our religion tells us to be frank and, and, and honest. Our religion tells us to be academically inclined. So we need to talk about this academically. <coughs> By the way, interesting point here. In 1966, uh, there was an entire worldwide conference in Cairo over this story. The whole conference was over this story to discuss it academically and to find out. And all the people presented papers and they talked about, discussed it 40 years ago. And a lot of major scholars were present there. And the conclusion of the conference was that the story is fabricated. The story is not true. So we can say that the bulk of the scholars of our times want to cross out number two and three. And they say there's no need for it. And this is true to say this. And if you read almost any modern book of Sirah, from Sheikh Safir Imam Barak Furi to any of the famous books, you will find that this story is either not mentioned 
or it will mention it as a fabrication. Okay, as we said, academically speaking, we have to be honest here, we have to say, well, that's not the only position even within Sunni Islam. Some scholars have accepted version 2, and some scholars have even accepted version 3. And had they been small names, we could have ignored them, but they're all big names. Version 2, which says that Iblis said out loud, and the Prophet had no idea. Even this is easier to swallow, right? Because, I mean, if, if the Prophet didn't do anything, well then how can you blame him, right? You know, there's no, there's no uh, deception. Iblis simply used his own tongue and he threw it upon the people, right? This version is accepted by a lot of scholars, most importantly amongst them Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Ibn Hajar is a great scholar of hadith, he's the greatest scholar, specialist of Sahih Bukhari, he accepts this uh, version. And his point is that, look, it's true that every individual version of the story is not reported with an authentic chain. But when you put all of them together, each weak chain kind of sort of gives supporting evidence and it becomes acceptable. Now this uh, leads us to a little bit of a one minute tangent. In the sciences of hadith, when you have a lot of weak individual chains, but it's of the same incident or the same hadith, the scholars of hadith then put these weak chains together and they say, okay, a little bit of weakness in chain X, a little bit of weakness in chain Y, put together it means that the hadith is authentic. And this is a true principle, and Ibn Hajar applied it to this incident. He said there's five or six reports, all of them are weak. He says this, I read this myself, all of them are weak. But put together, it shows that there's some basis to the story. So Ibn Hajar accepts version two. Now, uh, by the way, Shaykh al-Albani in his criticism of the story, he says, what Ibn Hajar says is true, that weak reports put together become authentic, but not every single time. There's a science behind it. And in this case, and then he goes into academic detail. In this case, you cannot apply the rule. Now that's a little bit advanced for this class, but for this uh, lecture, but you get the point. That he agrees with the rule, two or three weak traditions become authentic. But then he says this rule has exceptions. If this is not met, if this is not met, and then he applies those exceptions. And that's the whole purpose of the book, that he has the booklet. It's to show that you cannot take these weak traditions in this case and then put them together. And he had, that's a little bit of an academic discussion. Now, that's version number two. Version number three, had it been supported by anybody else, I would have left it. Unfortunately, or whatever, we had, this is the fact of the matter, it is supported by one of the greatest scholars of Islam that Islam has ever seen. And it is someone whom I admire immensely, and that is Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Ibn Taymiyyah supported version three. And Ibn Taymiyyah writes about this in a number of his uh, uh, books and, and his tafsirs, and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says that not only do all of the reports add up and make it authentic, but the verse of Surah Hajj is crystal clear. The verse of Surah Hajj is crystal clear. That it clearly says that, Ya Rasulullah, it's not only you, every single prophet before you, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍّ now, some of you who understand Arabic will say, doesn't tamanna mean to wish? Right? Now, here is where we get a little bit more technical. That the word tamanna actually, originally, it did mean to recite. And there are many poems in pre-Islamic, uh, the, the Mu'allaqat and others, they have the word tamanna to mean to recite. And that's why many, even of the Sahaba, Ibn Abbas himself said, Tamanna, he means to recite, right? Later on, one of the meanings of Tamanna means to wish. So even this becomes now another dimension of complexity, right? And now you're getting a little bit, I'm opening up a little bit of a window of Islamic academics. It is a very complex science. So this ayah can also be interpreted two ways. إِلَّا إِذَا tamanna, Interpretation one, except that when he recites, أَلْقَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي أُمْنِيَّتِهِ Shaytan produces something and throws it into his recitation. Allah will abrogate what Shaytan said. Then Allah will make his ayat firm and clear. Wallahu alimun hakim. 
so that لِيَجْعَلَ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانُ فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ So that Allah will cause this to be a test for those whose hearts have a disease. And for those قَاسِيَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts are hard. This shaitanic recitation will become a test for them. So Ibn Taymiyyah says the verse is very clear and this is what happened with Surah Al-Najm. Now, the other school or the other interpretation says this verse has nothing to do with Surah Al-Najm and the satanic verses. Rather, it's a general verse, take it at face value, that no prophet or messenger has wishes, tamanna here would become wishes, except that shaitan tries to tamper with his intentions, make you insincere, make you think of something else, and Allah will get rid of what shaitan says, and Allah will affirm his ayat. So they understand Surah Hajj verse 52 in a whole different tangent. I.e. it has nothing to do with Surah Al-Najm, it has nothing to do with satanic verses. You understand this point? Right? Now Ibn Taymiyyah responds to them and says, but then how do you understand the verse uh, after this? لِيَجْعَلَ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانُ فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ that whatever the shaitan has said will become a fitna for those whose hearts have a disease. This means, Ibn Taymiyyah says, that they have heard something. It's not internal in the mind of the Prophet. <coughs> this means that they've heard something and it is a fitna for them. Now, there's another dimension here. Uh, I have to <laughs> go into more dimensions here because this is the whole purpose. And this is a theological dimension. The majority of those who said version 2 and 3 cannot happen and especially version 3. They said, we don't care what the riwayat, what the versions say, we cannot accept this as theology, as aqidah. Why? Because you're claiming that shaitan and, 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 and um, Jibreel, right, could pretend to be each other. That the Prophet couldn't tell the difference. That, and this is the key point now, the revelation itself has the possibi possibility to be corrupted and tampered. The integrity of the wahi becomes compromised. So, as one of them says, a famous call of our times, I don't care if the isnads are like the sun, the brightest the sun. Kashems, I'm not going to accept this story. This is a scholar of our times writing this, right? And a lot of the previous scholars as well, they said some similar things. Is that we can't, uh, Al-Qadi Iyad is one of them. Al-Qadi Iyad is, uh, he has a, one of the best books of Sirah, Al-Shifa bi Huquq al-Mustafa. Al-Shifa bi Huquq al-Mustafa. Uh, that which causes the heart to be cured by talking about the rights of the Prophet Wasallam. It's a two volume book and it's all about Sirah and Prophet specialities and miracles. And he says, how can any Muslim believe in this story basically, right? How can anyone who loves the Rasulullah and believe in this story? So he uses an emotional argument, right? And he says, how can anybody accept that the Prophet could basically slip into this and take uh, shaitan's wahi or shaitan's uh, recitation? And so they say, because the prophets can never commit mistakes, because they are, what's the Arabic word? Ma'asum. This is a theological concept. Because they are ma'asum. Ma'asum means they cannot commit mistakes. We cannot accept that this incident occurred. Ibn Hajar basically says, look, virgin 2 doesn't compromise the Prophet's isma. You understand this point? Do you understand this point, everybody? Version 2, in which shaitan recites without the Prophet hearing, doesn't compromise his isma. So he says, therefore, we'll neglect version 3. Get rid of that one, and we'll accept version 2. Because I'm not willing to compromise the Prophet's isma. You guys following this point, right? So Ibn Hajar accepts version 2 because it has nothing to do with the Prophet's isma. It's not his fault. Shaitan recited. Okay, we can accept that. And if you are to accept that, that's not that big of a deal because it's Shaitan reciting. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah said, did Ibn Taymiyyah not believe in isma? Of course he did. Every Muslim, every Sunni Muslim I should say, because the Mu'tazila didn't agree with this. Every Sunni Muslim says that the Prophet ﷺ is ma'asum. No Muslim, Sunni Muslim says otherwise. So then how did Ibn Taymiyyah understand this? He said, 
his definition of isma is basically different than that of the other Muslim, Sunni Muslims. And this is now a theological controversy. Can the prophets commit sins and mistakes or not? According to Ibn Taymiyyah, the prophets cannot commit major mistakes and sins, number one. Number two, they cannot commit uh, fawahish or, or, or lewd sins, right? Sins are of different types and fawahish means vulgar sins. No prophet can commit vulgarity. Number three, they cannot lie ever. Lying is simply not possible for the prophets. But, Ibn Taymiyyah says, they can make judgmental errors. Judgmental errors is not a sin. It's an error in what you want to do. And he then quotes many examples from the seerah. The number one example is what? Who can tell me? Prisoners of the Battle of Badr. The prisoners of the Battle of Badr. The prisoners of the Battle of Badr. The number one example. Clearly, the Prophet decided to do something and Allah revealed in the Quran that مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ It's not befitting for the Prophet. أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أسرع, That he take prisoners of war حَتَّى يُدْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically let it go but he wasn't, he said this isn't the best decision you made. So this is a judgmental error. It has nothing to do with a mistake. But then Ibn Taymiyyah says something which of course it sounds very bad but if you think about it it's actually very easy to swallow and true. The prophets can commit minor sins but two things. Number one, they do not persist in the sin. Number two, they repent immediately. And then of course he gives the number one example that nobody can argue with and that is why are we here on earth? Our father Adam السلام, committed a sin. Did he not commit a sin? I mean, Allah says in the Quran that وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ Adam was a Nabi, but it says Nabis are also ma'asum. By unanimous consensus, Nabi and Rasul are all ma'asumin. They have a category above us. And so Adam was told not to eat and he ate. Also, Ibn Taymiyyah quotes Surah Al-Fatah, verse 2. لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ What does this verse translate as? So that Allah can, can do what? Forgive. forgive. So clearly, Allah is forgiving. مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ Ibn Taymiyyah's conception of our Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is that he is the best human, but he's a human. And he can commit minor mistakes, minor errors, like all the prophets, but he cannot persist in them. And he will repent immediately. And then he says, and in this repentance is the perfection. That Allah made the prophets true role models for us. Because if he had made them like angels, how would they be role models? So Ibn Taymiyyah actually has a very interesting point here. right? That they are human, they're not superhuman. But their humanity is as perfect as possible. Okay. Now, when it comes to this issue of the quote-unquote satanic verses, as I said, this name is not found in Islamic sources, but just to understand it, uh, we can call it Qissat al-Gharaniq. But the story, this story, Ibn Taymiyyah says that this does not show at all that the wahi has been corrupted. Rather, it shows it has been protected and that the Prophet is the most truthful of all those who speak the truth. Why? Because of the very fact that he came clean with the story. And that he said to everybody, this story that would actually impugn him and make him look bad, but he still said the truth. You guys following this point here, right? And then he quotes the famous hadith of Aisha in Sahih Bukhari. That Aisha says, we're going to talk about this, inshallah, many, many months from now when we get to that story. Uh, let me just say as a footnote, there are two stories that are highly sensitive in the seerah. And highly controversial, and highly emotional, and highly problematic. Keep on saying so many things. Two stories in particular. And both of them require us to be calm, collect, academic. The first of these is this, satanic verses. And the second is the story of Zainab. And we'll get to the story of Zainab when we get to it. And that's a very 
That's a very difficult story. Very difficult story, and again, the non-Muslims have a field trip with it. And we need to talk about it academically, but that's easier to resolve. That is easier to resolve. Nonetheless, it is... It has its own problematic issues. Now, story of Zainab we'll talk about when we talk about it. But Allah revealed in the Quran verses about Zainab and about who was Zainab married to? Zayd, right? Zayd ibn Haritha, the very one whom the Prophet adopted, right? Zayd ibn Muhammad and Zayd ibn Haritha. And so Zayd and Zainab were married, and then eventually uh, they were having a lot of problems, and then eventually. Allah revealed in the Quran that Zainab is your wife after the divorce. So before the divorce, Zayd and Zayd came to the Prophet wanting to divorce Zainab. Zayd came to the Prophet wanting to divorce Zainab. Now the Quran says that basically you advised him not to divorce her and you were scared of the people. This is in the Quran. وَتَخْشَ النَّاسَ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَن تَخْشَى and you should have been scared of Allah. You understand the verse so far. As for what it applies to, we'll get to that. I don't even want to start that story right now because that's a whole different tangent. We'll get to there someday, inshallah. Inshallah ta'ala. And we will talk about it fully academically because I personally don't believe in hiding the truth. And I think that if we especially, if we were living maybe in a Muslim country, even then I would say, khalas, let's just ignore these tales and then tell you the easy stuff. But subhanAllah, when a non-Muslim is going to come and say, look, this is what your book says. And you don't know what it says, and you have no idea. Wallahi, I have met Muslims who when they are told of this story, the way that it is found in non-Muslim books, they get ideas of, A'udhu Billah, how is it possible? Right? They have no clue. And so we're living in an environment where our religion is being attacked, and the best mechanism to defend ourselves is to be armed with knowledge. Ignorance is not bliss. Knowledge is power. And we need to embrace these stories and say them and then critique them. So when we get there, I'll talk about the difficult issues, uh, and they are difficult issues. For now, let's just take the first at face value. You were scared of the people, you should have been scared of Allah. That's in the Quran, correct? Aisha says, this hadith is in Bukhari. If the Prophet ﷺ had hidden anything from the Quran, he would have hidden this verse. But he still recited it to the people. And to this day, it is in the Quran. You guys following this point, right? He didn't have to tell us the verse, meaning, meaning he could have hidden it. Of course, Allah would have exposed him, but he could have hidden it, right? He could, nobody knows Jibreel is coming and telling him anything, except if he tells us, correct? Still, he recited all of these verses to us. And to this day, we have Surah Al-Ahzab. وَتَخْشَ النَّاسَ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَن تَخْشَى فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدُ مِنْهَا وَطَرًا زَوَّجْنَاكَهَا This is in the Quran. Allah is not embarrassed of the truth. And so when Zayd has finished his divorce of her, you have been married to her. Zawajnaka. And therefore, this is the only nikah that didn't require any witnesses, any wali. Allah has done the nikah in the Quran. We recite the marriage contract every day. We read salah. Every time this ayah is revealed, this is the marriage contract. Without any nikah, without any wali, without any ma anything. Allah says, Zawajnaka. What else do you need to say? Right? And so when the divorce was finished and the idda was finished, Zainab became a wife of the Prophet instantaneously, without any ceremony being done. Okay, now you understand non Muslims have a field trip. We'll talk about that then. But for now, the point is Aisha says if the Prophet wanted to hide something, he would have hidden this verse, but he didn't hide it. Ibn Taymiyyah says, why can't we apply the same thing too? to this story? That, yes, this is exactly what happened. That Allah allowed, because everything happens by the will of Allah, Allah allowed the shaitan to get in two verses, and then Allah abrogated what shaitan said, and Allah perfected his verses, and the Prophet ﷺ came clean and said everything. And so my point being here, if you really think about it, all three versions... They have, their, they have their possibilities, right? And there are major scholars on all, three, uh, on all three sides of this equation. Now, what is my opinion about this? And astaghfirullah, who am I to compete with these great, great scholars? But nonetheless, I need to give you some as a minor student of knowledge, and I do not compete at all with the great people we have mentioned. 
We have Ibn Kathir, we have Ibn Hajar, we have Ibn Taymiyyah, and subhanAllah, all three are major giants in our religion. At the same time, we're allowed to give our own opinions on this issue, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows the truth. In my humble opinion, version 1 is the one that we need, and we don't need version 2 and 3. And we can cross them out for the following seven reasons. For the following seven reasons. Reason, or number one, number one. It is true to say that claiming that shaitan can inspire the Prophet ﷺ, even though Ibn Taymiyyah explained it away, and there is a, a, a way to explain it away like he did, still it does seem to interfere with the process of wahi. And Allah Azza wa Jal has guaranteed the process of wahi. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه. And Allah says, إنا نحن نزل الذكر وإنا له لحافظون. And Allah says, وإنه لتنزيل رب العالمين نزل به الروح الأمين. In other words, so many verses talking about the purity of revelation that no one can falsify the revelation. Now, if Ibn Taymiyyah had been in front of me, he would say, but Allah, but the the revelation was not falsified, and we know what is true from what is false. You understand his refutation, right? Still. My heart inclines towards the fact the purity of revelation should not be compromised. Number two, there is no authentic version of the shaitanic incident at all. Every single incident that is reported in Tabari and Al Wahidi is weak, every one of them. And none of them is an unbroken chain back to the Prophet Muhammad. None of them. The strongest one, Al Baqbaq. And uh, I came across this in one of the ancient theological texts of Ad-Darimi when he was talking about his opponent. He goes, this opponent, all he can do is give baq baq like the baq baq. And I was like, wow, as a desi, I actually understand this. Because uh, most Arabs have no idea what baq baq is now. But this is now, we know what baq baq is very well. Um, so I haven't memorized his baq baq. Uh, uh, but people have attempted to fabricate the Quran. The, 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 the point is they've never succeeded in that, right? That's the point. So it doesn't go against this, this thing. Any question from the sisters in the back? I have a timeline question. A timeline question, yes, go ahead. When was this surah exactly revealed to Prophet? And particularly this incident, when he is reciting, that means it is already revealed. Yes. So how can will be there be addition or deletion? Because he already revealed something, it is fixed. So when he is reciting, he is under pause for two minutes? Some so minutes. according to version number three, right. Shaitan added while Jibreel was paused. Shaitan added something and the Prophet thought it was Jibreel. This is version three. Okay. That's that's all that we know. Another timeline question, yeah, time -line question. yes. Uh, in the chronology of revelations, uh, how the very perceptive question. Uh, the question is, when was Surah Hajj verse 52 revealed? Surah Hajj overall, most scholars say, was revealed during the Hijrah. It was the only revelation that occurred during the Hijrah. However, that doesn't mean much because... We don't have a chronology for every ayah of the Qur'an. And a lot of times we have the bulk of a surah revealed one place, but one or two ayahs somewhere else and then they're put in there. Right? And so, even if we know, now some people have tried to do this as well, but this, to say that Surah Al-Hajj was generally revealed later on. But in response it can be said, okay, maybe the bulk was revealed later on, but this ayah itself, there's nothing incorrect to say it might have been revealed earlier because for most of the verses of the Quran we don't have a specific timeline of when they were revealed okay any question for the sisters I have don't see any hands from the sisters uh, brother go ahead in the back go ahead you're, you're next don't worry. I saw you go ahead yes it was just interesting for me not to hear from the arguments against version 2 and version 3 just from a simple logical perspective that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to teach a tawheed, understood a tawheed, and, and uttering those words is going against everything that he understands, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I just imagine that happening, it just like, it would seem that this is yours, but he would have turned around. 
you know, this doesn't make no sense given what I'm here to, to bring in. Is there any comments on that, why that argument was not brought? So uh, the question is a very good one, and for those who didn't hear it, is that why uh, somebody could say, why didn't the Prophet himself, if versions 2 and 3 are authentic, why didn't he himself, red light start going off and saying, what's wrong with this? Uh, of course, those who follow version 1 story will say, that's the whole point. Right? And they will say, he didn't because it didn't happen. You understand this point, right? Those who follow versions 2 and 3, uh, of course, version 2 as well doesn't raise that issue. Because version 2, you're not, you didn't, he didn't hear it. It's only version 3 that raises this issue. And where there's a will, there's a way to interpret it. And so what they would say is, this is his complete submission. That whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it will be accepted. And he's not going to question. If Allah azza wa is saying that you may go through these beings to reach me, then that is what he is saying. Because his job is to give the balag and not to question. That is going to be the response. I don't agree with version 3 Aslan, so I would agree with you. And say it doesn't... There's something for the min hu shay. Something is just not right. You have a question, go ahead. Does anybody of the scholars think these two verses are supposed to be added to the Quran? Oh no, 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 no. The question is, does anybody claim that these two verses are part of the Quran? Only non-Muslims claim this. Nobody. Because even the language, even the... It doesn't fit the style of the Quran. Even the language, yes. Salam alaykum. I think there are a lot of, uh, you brought them a lot of academic points. I mean, it raises a lot of questions about, for example, the powers of Shaitan, what the powers of Shaitan. What can he do and what can he do? That's number one. Number two, you raised about the, the level of quote-unquote minor mistakes that you, that you said the Nabi or the Rasul may do. In this sense, this does not seem like a minor mistake because this is, you're talking of the revolution, you're not talking of a judgmental decision. That's, then the third point I was going to bring to you is, you brought in another point of how the way he is processed. For example, one of the points you bring in is the way he is not just processed as it is being revealed, but sometimes it is like in DNA we have in medicine, it's called splicing of the genes. The genes are collected in a way once the baby comes together to produce the best genes. So may Allah is Allah in a position to reprocess the message. Okay, you're asking three questions. I need to go one by one. Too many is just like... These are the three points I'm referring to basically. Oh no, these are three different points. So let's go one by one. What was your first one? I completely forgot. <laughs> the question is, how much power does shaitan have? How much power does shaitan have? As much as you give him. As much as you give him, in the in case the shaitan is kind of right? No, but that's his shaitan. This is Iblis himself doing it. You're getting confused. That's his personal shaitan. Every one of us has a qareen. The Prophet ﷺ, Allah has allowed his qareen to become Muslim. In this shaitanic verses, that's Iblis doing the job. The big shaitan, Iblis, doing this. So that is not a Muslim. Iblis is not a Muslim. I, I, will, I will forward the second question or the third one. The question is when the Bahi has been processed, it, it seems that Allah has, there, there is some abrogation. Law. So which Allah says, it's up to him, he can abrogate ayahs, it, it, it's up to him. But it seems from what you said, what it, uh, from Surah Hajj, is that the processing of the Bahi has been done even beyond the way it's been uttered by the Prophet. Is that correct? So for those who accept version 3, they would have to modify. For versions 1 and 2 is not a problem. For those who accept version 3, Ibn Taymiyyah clearly says this, that the wahi was not tampered with. That's the whole point. That Allah did make his verses clear. Are we confused about what the Quran is? No. And that's the point. So wahi was not tampered with. An attempt at tampering was made and Allah rebuffed the attempt. That's Ibn Taymiyyah's point. It was made, but it was rebuffed. And so there is no confusion in our times. Right? Uh, sisters, no questions at all. I'm wondering, usually you have questions. Huh? They're scared, They're scared of the story? <laughs> so, uh, yes, go ahead. From an all-Muslim perspective, uh, how would you respond that how does a prophet, any prophet, differentiate between a and uh, somebody trying to do From this incident and also from the instance of Ibrahim for where he was inspired to offer his son for sacrifice. Hmm. So how does he know is that a true message? Or is that a false So do you understand this is why the non-Muslims love this story? 
That's exactly why they love the story. That there's one of, if you're, you, the, the question is, how do you defend that the process, any Prophet, not just our Prophet can differentiate between uh, the Wahi from Allah and between Shaitan. Now, for those who don't believe in our Prophet or any Prophet, how do they explain Islam? One of two things. Either, A'udhu Billah, the Prophets are outright liars, in which case this story becomes a political maneuver, right, that he's trying to appease as a politician, then he comes back. Or, A'udhu Billah, he's deluded. And he's hearing voices and he doesn't know who they're from. Either it's an internal or it could be, you know, once upon a time, Christian missionaries literally thought that, A'udhu Billah, and to this day, Pat Roberts and others, they say he's inspired by the devil. He did get an inspiration, he, A'udhu Billah, but that's what they say, right? And so again, this is the story that they jump on. Now, we need to be academic here and say, even if they misinterpret it, there is a correct interpretation that Ibn Hajar or Ibn Taymiyyah can also get out. We need to be clear here, right? Their misinterpretation should not cause us to reject Ibn Hajar's or Ibn Taymiyyah's, even though we disagree with it academically. But to defend is very easy, and that's what Ibn Taymiyyah says, that we do know what is Qur'an and we do know what is not Qur'an. And in the end, ثُمَّ يُحْكِمُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِي Allah will make his ayat crystal clear. يُحْكِم means to make it crystal clear. And that is exactly what happened. In the end, there is an element of faith. I, I can't scientifically, you know, demarcate between this and that. There is an element of faith, and we can give us proof that the Qur'an has never been disagreed about since its very beginning. Yani all Muslims have agreed what is the Qur'an. These two verses have never been falsely attributed. Even those who say version 3, no, it is not a part of the Qur'an. So there is an element of faith that they will believe this Qur'an to be from Allah Azza wa Jal. We need to uh, call it uh, a story.